Okay, so let's go on and have a third uh, lecture on some of this course. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So this is my second lecture. Um, oh, the second lecture. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, um, and then this will be, you can say, about um, advanced. I will introduce medium X fields. You can say that um, last time I was talking about usual X bundles and X fields, and you will see I call them small X fields. And tomorrow will be the last lecture. And I'm going to talk about big, big X um, fields and, and the big algebra. So there is this nice uh, three different level of uh, studying the strength. So today um, we will, um, I will show you very geometrical um, uh, motivations, uh, which um, um, were the main motivations for the algebraic things, which will mostly happen um, tomorrow. Um, and then in particular, equivalent cohomology will be the first. But before I am starting with, um, with this, let me just recall as a for notation, and people might have already forgotten what was what from lecture one. So just um, as to recall, we have been looking at um, very stable Higgs bundles. And then for us, the interesting examples are at the top of the nilpotent cone. So the very top is the canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle, this E0, which has this particular decomposition into um, direct sum of vector bundles with, uh, with this uh, regular unipot uh, regular nilpotent X field, and then the upward flow from there was nothing else but the H section, which is again explicitly given as the companion matrix of the um, characteristic polynomial. And then uh, I just to, to be gentle, I just looked at one further example of uh, upward flows, namely um, just one Hackett transformation at the given point C. And, and then what's also important to, to know if you are a bit more I mean, with the X moduli space, the doing Hecker transformation changes the degree of the bundles. And in this particular case, we are going to move to a different um, component of the moduli space. And the next guy, the, um, which I call EK, that will live in the different component. Again, on the top inside the component. But, um, but in a different component. And, and then the bundle is very similar. You just do the Hecke transformation, the K dimensional subspace, and you end up with this vector bundle and this slightly modified um, regular nilpotent um, matrix, which is actually not no longer regular at the, at the point, exactly at the point C. And then we were, I was like arguing that if you do elementary Hecke transformation, the whole of the, a hitching section, then we end up with the upward flow from this particular very stable and therefore very stable X bundle. And this was our theorem at the end. Although this comment that I said that it's actually on the top, it already implies at least geometrically intuitive way that these EKs are themselves very stable. And then I said that very stable was. Um, equivalent of the hitching map restricted to the upper pole being proper. And then you show that you can show it's uh, even stronger. In the case, it's finite flat. It's a very uh, uh, beautiful, very simple uh, um, kind of map. And then at the end, I introduced the multiplicity algebra to somehow um, measure the, the multiplicity of this map. So it's a, so it's, you should think of this as a multi-section of the hitching map. And the multiplicity is the, the generic, um, uh, the length of the generic fiber or the length of the fibers because it's uh, flat, it's always the same. Um, and, and then also there is this very nice and very down to very simple algebra you can attach uh, to this over zero, you just compute the scheme central fiber, which you can do explicitly. And then I said that thing was very stable if and only if this algebra was of. Oh, uh, finite dimensional <laughs> equation is not allowed. Um, mm -hmm. And and then uh, amazingly and beautifully, it is a graded Parker duality Turing. And then partly, I mean, one argument is 
just simply saying that this is a complete intersection ideal by the, you have as many uh, equations as the code dimension of your variety. Um, and um, okay, and so today what I'm going to do, we are going to try to understand now the kitchen map restricted to this particular upward flows. And then we will see how very nicely the, um, the multiplicity algebra could be read off from that. Tell us for different k, are these in the same component or are they different? No, they're always we have as many components as k is k goes between one and uh, zero to n minus one. So they actually are the top, you'll be on the top components on each of the n different components. And that's what you would expect from Hecker transformation to you always move uh, the, the degree, you always move the components. Okay. Um, so then uh, let's then start with an other surprising setup where you do see similar uh, uh, finite flat morphisms between, okay, in, in this case, it will be between vector spaces of the same dimension, which will look like the Hitchin system on a, a, a very stable upward flow, namely equivalent cohomology of um, equivalently formal varieties. So very quickly, let me recall uh, what things are here for us for notation. We will look at complex reductive group and uh, equivalent homology with respect to that. And the coefficients will be the cohomology of the classifying space of the universal um, principle G bundle. So this will be your coefficient ring, which actually you can compute. It's uh, very simple uh, and uh, very nice. It's a polynomial ring because of Chevalier's theorem. Um, you, you, yes, and therefore we will later look at spec. The, um, the spectrum of the polynomial ring will be a vector space and fi space. So now we have um, the, the equivariant setup. So G will now act on a say an edge break variety. This this thing actually is more general to talk about equivariant homology. We could have taken complex groups and and any sort of topological space. Then you can form the Borel quotient. Uh, as this um, the, in this construction, um, the hom or homotopy quotient is well defined. Everything is only up to homotopy, and then you can compute the cohomology of the Borel quotient, and that will be the definition of the equivalent cohomology. But the, this thing is um, naturally fibers over a BG. If you just divide the second factor, so it's a vibration, the Borel quotient vibration over. B with fibers X, the, the isomorphic with X of with the space. And so this is a algebra there from the cohomology of the base, the H star G algebra. And I will want to show you that this in, in nice cases will be just like the region system on the workflows. So namely the nice case is equivalently formal, which is again many um, equivalent definitions. Some Larry says spectral sequence need to degenerate abstractly speaking, but also you should, uh, in the equivalent formal case, you can recover ordinary cohomology from equivalent cohomology by just uh, taking the point over the fiber. Um, or an alternative way, which is uh, related to this finite flatness I already mentioned, that the equivalent cohomology will be a free uh, module over the base. A finite free module, and uh, then this also implies okay, so what's important for us that we want to have commutative algebras, and the cohomology ring, of course, is just uh, semi -com uh, you know, anti commutative. But in fact, in all our cases, of cohomology will vanish, which in fact is already implies equivalent formality. So there is not a, no cohomology, and we will only consider the even cohomology anyway which there is only that. And so in the equivalently formal case, we will have a proper affine uh, scheme that the spectrum of the equivalent cohomology over the base, which actually looks like some sort of Hitchin system. In fact, this is this model uh, base, which um, and go, uh, Charles was talking about, which then you take maps into, and that will be the Hitchin base. And so I have this nice um, way to now understand what is the Hitchin map restricted to this particular kind of upward flows. And then what I can say is that it can be modeled on the equivalent cohomology of a particularly nice 
smooth projective variety by the Grassmannian of gate lanes on CN. And so, in fact, you have a very nice um, pullback diagram. Uh, you can evaluate at a point C. So we have this point C fixed. Everything in the upward flow depended on a point C. That's where we made that modification, that Hecke transformation. So you evaluate at that point, then you will end up in this, in this base. You have the spectrum vector cohomology, and the statement is that this map is precisely modeled uh, by this, uh, this spectrum of equilateral cohomology. It turns out then in this case, this is actually just as a polynomial ring. So the equilateral cohomology of the um, Grassmannian, in fact, of any um, partial flat variety is always a polynomial ring. This is a kind of special uh, for these, these, these examples. Can you recall what minuscule means here? Where do I say minuscule? Minuscule upward flow. Oh, so that's actually a good point because I don't think I did it um, explain this very well last time. So the, the way how we are labeling the type one one upward flows, if you would just mod modify at one point, at that one point we just have a a, a dominant um, co-character. That's what um, labels the packet transformations. But in fact, I've seen that. The C star uh, fixed points, type one, one fixed points can be uh, thought of um, at the point C to be labeled by dominant co character. So that's a, a representation of the Legland's dual group. And, and then among the representations, there are the nice one, the nicest, easiest ones are the minuscule ones. And in fact, those are minimal with respect to a natural partial ordering among the weights which exactly is going to mirror or natural. Um, way of partially ordering this type one one fixed points. Namely, you can close down your upward flow, and then if uh, it is hit someone, that that guy is is uh, below it. And so, minus Q in the in the representation theory, it completely matches or notion of very stable. So, very stable upward flow uh, corresponds to this minus Q. Uh, actually, from I should say, O minus Q, because it's about the Legner's model. Okay, so how do you can prove such a thing? Um, so, so basically what you're doing is that you are understanding this as we I already mentioned the second transformation of the aging section. So on the aging section, you want to do hecker transformations. You take k-dimensional subspaces of the vector bundle at that point C. You are working inside the Grassmannian, but not all of the hecker transformations are only the ones which are the Higgs field is uh, uh, the fixing are allowed. And that condition will give a, a sort of fixed point scheme on the Grassmannian, the, the points where the thing will be allowed. And then to compute the, um, uh, uh, the, um, the fixed point scheme, at the end, it turns out to be the same as equivalent homology. And you can see more examples of such phenomena in our paper with Camille. Who is here? Um, um, yes, and so later tomorrow we will generalize this to all FI Schubert varieties. These are the spaces of Hecke transformations that are relevant uh, for us. But today things are going to be easy because this FI Schubert variety is smooth, it's just the Grassmannian in this case. And um, so it's a clear cohomology, everything will be easy to understand. And then the very nice consequence of this is the fact that the zero fiber, the scheme thread for zero fiber of this is coordinate ring, which is precisely the ordinary cohomology ring of the, uh, the Grassmannian. And that was uh, our first uh, observation with Nigel when we started to, uh, after finishing the paper, where we have computed, of course, equivalent multiplicity of these upward flows. We found this was a uh, Q binomial coefficient, so it looked like the Poincare component of the Grassmannian, but we didn't see the homology ring of the Grassmannian, and here actually it is like that. So we first identified it as the multiplicity algebra, and later I, I saw it that it actually, the, it's not just over zero, but the whole thing is nothing but the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian. Okay, so that was the first uh, uh, ingredient to understand these upward flows. And now we will be motivated by mirror symmetry. You remember our motivation is to try to understand the mirror 
side and the mirror side should be uh, this representation that we take the inverse or bundle in the uh, dual side and we take that irreducible representation that uh, corresponds to this uh, dominant co-character there and in that representation we have a vector bundle on the mirror side and we will want to see what this equilibrium homology corresponds on the mirror side of this universal bundle. <coughs> And so I show you that it is exactly that Kirill of algebra which will uh, match this equilibrium homology structure. And so now I will work on the mirror side, but I didn't want to contaminate the notation. So it actually should be G check probably, but uh, imagine that we just in an abstract discussion about, uh, about universal bundles for group G. So we take a, a, a highest weight representation of G and uh, I just first tell you the definition of the Kirillov algebra. So Kirillov defined this in 2000 um, to understand the multiplicities of irreducible representations, which I uh, apparently we don't understand uh, well enough. And uh, it was this is basically his definition. So you take um, this abstract algebra, you take this um, symmetric algebra on the, um, well, he actually had here the the algebra itself, but we always identify the Lie algebra with this dual with the fixed uh, G uh, invariant um, bilinear form on the Lie algebra, like the killing form. Um, and so then if you can change it to, to G star, it's important for us because this then will be just the angle functions on the Lie algebra G with its natural G action. And then of course I also the G acting on the, uh, on on the matrix or on the endomorphism of the representation. And then we just take invariance. So that's by definition, okay, before I'm telling you what kind of algebra it is, I tell you how I think about this because I, for me, this is just abstract uh, algebra. But geometrically, the same thing is just thinking about polynomial maps, algebraic maps between the real algebra. So these are polynomial maps between vector spaces and the matrices of the representation, which is um, G equivalent. So that's a, a nice way to fully formulate this abstract algebra thing. Okay, so what you get is an associative algebra graded by the degree of the uh, polynomials on G. Uh, and then, of course, if I have just a invariant polynomial of G, I can scale and multiply any object that it's still going to be G invariant so or for the same algebra as before we'll naturally act on it so it will be an associative graded a star g algebra and that's i call it hero algebra Kirillo calls it classical family algebra that's the reason for c uh, but Kirillo algebra i find it uh, more appropriate um and then let me show you this small operator i mentioned so the usual x field uh, will correspond to this uh, small operator. So you can always, of course, have a, a simple map from here to there, the representation of the Lie algebra itself. So you take the you know, group representation, you take it on the, uh, the Lie algebra version of that, and that gives you a map, which will be G. Uh, in equivariant, that's a very important, most important map. I call this the small operator. So there will be, you will see many others in most of the cases. So Kirillov identifies one of the first important properties when is this algebra commutative in the very first paper he wrote and he showed that it is if and only if there are no uh, multiplicities of the weight spaces inside the representation. Uh, I will not go into those. There are some examples of, of those as well, which are not minuscule, but the minuscule ones in particular uh, uh, are uh, so weight multiplicity free. So we will concentrate on the minuscule one. Uh, so basically, we will discuss SLN. So it's just the fundamental representations for SLN. So here it is uh, the theorem. What will be this theorem? Yes. I'm going to show you how to, what will actually match under mirror symmetry with the equivalent homology. And this will be using the Kirillov algebra. Um, for the uh, joint, uh, for the fun case fundamental representation. So this is the case exterior power of the standard representation. 
we evaluate uh, it at the point C. So this is a vector bundle, which is isomorphic. If this one, if you think now E uh, in the standard representation, basically the same as the, uh, the principal bundle itself. And then along the Hitchin section, we will be able to use this algebra to construct first by just the, the definition of the algebra, we will be able to define matrices um, in the representation. But this algebra will be very nice. It will be a cyclic, in this case, commutative algebra. And that way, this will actually endow this vector bundle with a bundle of algebra structures, a sheaf of algebra structures. We will be able to multiply um, any two uh, elements in this vector bundle using this uh, Kirillov algebra. So don't worry, and this is my usual slide from the talks I give, but because I have more time, I will very be very explicit in the next slides instead of just throwing this at you. What is what is bold E? I'm confused. Yeah. Bold? The E, what is the E? E, okay, this is the universal bundle, uh -huh. uh, the SLM bundle. In principle, it's a principle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here we, we in SLM we always identify it with the, in the standard representation. So in this notation here it means it there, uh, but it in this notation it means the principal one. And then you take in this uh, representation you will get the associated vector bundle, which turns out to be the case exterior power of the standard uh, universal bundle. Okay. And over this bundle. I will show you in the next slide how to use the Kirill algebra to multiply the elements. And then what we will uh, see is that using this, uh, we will have a bundle of algebra structure there, whose spectrum we can take over the Hitchin base, the spectrum of this universal. But you remember that we are looking at it over the Hitchin section. So the Hitchin section is canonically identified with the Hitchin base. So this is over the Hitchin base, this bundle of algebras. I take the spectrum of that, and this will be uh, a finite flat, uh, a finite free map, finite flat map, and this will be uh, uh, the pool bag of this um, the spectrum of the um, the the Kirillov algebra. Okay, so that's what I say in my usual talks. The construction is by applying certain operators of Kirillov to the Higgs field at the point A. And then we use a property, a really crucial property of the, well, in this case of the Kirillov algebra for minuscule or even with multiplicity free representation due to Konyushev, that it is cyclic. So the so cyclic means this algebra by definition acts on, on the representation. And, and then it's cyclic, meaning that. Um, I think you need to take the, the highest weight or uh, vector, I think, or the lowest weight, but I think the highest weight, and, and then apply uh, the, open, the algebra, and you get everything in the whole, whole vector space. That's what this cyclicity means. And then you will see in the next slide how that will give us this algebra structure. Okay, and then again, this is just one line I usually say, but today I will be able to spell it out that when k equals one, I claim we have already seen uh, this bundle of algebra structure, at least I did see it. Uh, actually, I haven't managed to find it now, we, I haven't searched for it, but I think in one of Simpson's papers, probably, he does construct, uh, but maybe it's BNR, I don't remember who does it like that, but we will see that the BNR correspondence can be understood by the standard bundle of algebra structure like this. Okay, so this comes in a moment. So first, let's think about this minuscule uh, Kirillov algebra, you know, this particular case, the fundamental one for SLN. Okay, so we have this representation. Now there are no, no Higgs fields yet, so it's just we do this algebra again. And I'm not going to tell, construct you more operators. I already showed you one, the small operator M1. And now I'm going to construct you more, which I will call M operators. And this is some linear algebra. Uh, construction. So usually in this teaching story, we take uh, the characteristic polynomial, but in when I have a, uh, not the determinant, but just the case the exterior power, I can also take the case exterior power of this matrix and then bring to get a, um, a linear map uh, between now the case exterior powers of Cn. 
And then you expand it into to T, and then you will get now uh, linear maps A1 up to AK uh, like this. And these will be our M operators, which through the matrix A, it will uh, associate the I coefficient of this uh, polynomial. And then, um, right, and then you can check this is G equivariant. So this way we are going to get some more operators. So one, the first of them, this is how you actually define the, the Higgs field or, or the induced uh, um, um, linear transformation in the exterior power. We just take the linear term here. So that's going, going to be the small operator, but you will have higher ones here as well. Plus you have complementary ones. I can take now the n minus k exterior power and use them a natural pairing between the k's and the n minus k's uh, exterior powers to take a joint. And then I, I get now n minus k more matrices um, between the same two vector spaces. And this I call n operators here, but later n will, uh, oh, maybe not in the talk, but in my dictionary, n should be a different kind of operator, but not in this case. I just didn't find better letters, so it's n. It's also m operator in some sense. Okay, and then that's just the same uh, elements in the same algebra. <clears throat> and then now there is a simple linear algebra fact, which you, anyone can compute, that the product that these two matrices will uh, actually uh, multiply to just the um, scalar matrix with exactly the determinant showing up on the uh, main diagonal. Also, by somehow by uh, linear algebra arguments, these all these matrices are going to commute, which come from a given matrix A. So you will have we will have commuting operators satisfying this equation, which is exactly the defining uh, relation in the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian, as you might have. Not easily. So this way, uh, and then one can show that these operators, even the first k of them actually, but to get this nice relation, all of these n operators uh, will generate the whole of the real algebra. And then we just notice that this algebra is naturally isomorphic with the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian. And this is exactly what will how we will match it in mirror symmetry. So now let's apply uh, these operators, linear algebra operators, to the Higgs field along the each section, uh, along the each section. So I have now the vector one is always the same. The only thing we change is the the, the, the Higgs field, which will be the uh, the, the opinion matrix of the characteristic polynomial, and then we just apply the operators to the Higgs field. And so what you can think is that we repeat the same linear algebra construction, but on this bundle verb. And then we are going to construct the, the operators now are going to give us um, uh, elements here um, by which, okay, yes. And then you can rewrite this as a homomorphism between K to the minus i to the, the uh, to this vector bundle. And now, if you think you start to generate the cohomology ring, you will get everything. And so everything is here. So all of these uh, k exterior powers, all of them will correspond to one of these operators. And then you can just apply this operator and you will get um, precisely a map um, between two copies of the k exterior power of the of this line bundle. And if you think about this, you can show that this actually defines a multiplication on this vector model, a bundle of algebra structure here. Okay, so this I this bundle of algebra structure I will denote it like that, applying the, uh, the Kirillo algebra to this particular X field, the X bundle. On, on the underlying vector model. So I show you the easiest, of course, is the k plus one case because then it is easy to list the generate the, the additive generators of the homology ring, not just the, the multiplicative ones. Because in this case, you just take the small operator, 
the Higgs field itself, and then its uh, powers will be giving exactly the uh, the the elliptic basis. So I will get all of these guys. All of these guys will act on E zero via via these operators. And in this case, it's very easy to see this will give us a multiplication. Um, and this is, um, as I'm saying, is exactly the bundle of algebra structure we will be using to, to recover, the, to, to think about the DNR correspondence. They, for the first thing you can do now, you have um, um, uh, this bundle of algebra structure you defined on, on this particular, uh, corresponding to this point in the itching base, and you can take its spectrum. So its spectrum is uh, along over C, is going to be a finite cover of uh, of uh, of the curve itself, and then the the length of the so so the order of the cover is going to be well the the the, the, the dimension of the um, of the cohomology the IR characteristic of um, of that uh, Grassmann image in this case is just p and minus one. Um, and so it's an so it's an n choose with one cover, but it is actually the spectral curve. And this is, uh, as I say, one of the ways to define the spectral curve, which naturally embeds into here because you can just here. This is a free algebra generated by some generator, and here that generator is changed to phi. So phi will satisfy an order and equation by the Cayley Hamilton theorem. And so you will get a map from this algebra to this algebra. So spectrum, you will get this embedding, and this is precisely the total space of the dominant code model. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you, we might need a case study or not. Okay, so that uh, gives you uh, the construction of the spectral curve, but um, okay, and then what is now? Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to find the spectral curve inside the geometry of the, um, of these upward flows. So this is uh, what I call a synthetic uh, appearance of the spectral curve. It will appear inside the um, upward flows of the, from these top uh, components. But actually we have to take not just one upward flow, but all of them starting from the, the top fixed point component of C star. So we are going to think instead of upward flows, we are going to take the attractors the, all of the upper flows originating from the same component of the cis direction, we call this the attractor of F. It is always, okay, it's a union of Lagrange, and it's always a quasi-topic uh, sub-variety. And the most important ones for us are the ones which uh, contain or speci special Higgs bundles. Uh, these EKs are going to leave uh, in these components. And each of them, if you think about it, was just that you use just one point on the curve and it, you can actually prove it that there is nothing else. So um, each component is just a copy of the curve itself. Um, and uh, you can redo it from the pin one and then minus one. So this stomp component in any other uh, uh, component of the moduli space is all isomorphic with a copy of the curve itself. And we will now take the whole attractor from them, not just the upward flow from an inner point, but all attractor. And because they are on the top, you can show that they are closed. So we call them very stable as in an attractor. In fact, conjecturally, I don't, I expect that there will be no other, but you never know. I don't see any other uh, possible component whose attractor would be closed. So it's a, it's a much rougher thing than just uh, having a very stable upward flow because you need all the upward flows to be very stable and I don't think there exists another one. Um, okay, so now um, what we will do is that, so in the case of F1, uh, eventually I will show that uh, when you intersect this uh, attractor with the generic fiber of the in fact, any fiber of the Hitchin vibration, the intersection will be isomorphic precisely with the spectral curve. So that's what I meant to be a synthetic appearance of the spectral curve. But we wanted to come with the embedding into uh, T stars uh, C. And so that's why I'm going to show you that there is a natural embedding on any attractor 
if you're naturally embedded to T star of F. So, and this, I, I, the way how I did it is somehow really doing this, um, um, this ring of function things on the, on the upward flow. So let me show you my definition of the trace map. So it's what I will call the trace map. First, I do it on an upward flow. So it is an affine space. It has a ring of functions. And the ring of functions will have a subspace. We can take the degree one uh, functions. It has a cease direction. So there's a grading on the functions. And then I can take the subalgebra generated by the, the degree one functions. Typically, it will not be the whole thing. But this would be a subalgebra. So I can take a spectrum and then I get a map like that. Um, and then this map uh, you can identify with this vector space, the dual of the vector space uh, of the degree one generator. So this will be a finite dimensional vector space, which then in turn you can identify with the weight one um, directions in the tangent space to, to E of the of the um, of this upward flow. And this is a trace map. It also, in some cases, it is an actual trace. But you should think of this is um, uh, taking the, the linear parts of the of the functions on your variety. Then you can combine all of these uh, trace maps into a trace map of the whole attractor, and then it will map into the normal uh, bundle of F inside the whole moduli space of the the weight one part of that. And that actually is, in this case, isomorphic to the cotangent bundle of F because of the symplectic form. We'll pair the zero weight, which is just the tangent space of F, with the first weight, which is the cotangent space of F. And this way, you will get a map, which I call the trace map. And, and I know you, you may not be happy with this. And for, fortunately for us, Nigel wasn't happy with this either. And then he <laughs> found an alternative differential geometrical construction for the trace map. So his uh, construction goes like this. Um, so we take the symplectic form, we take the vector field generated by the cis direction, and then we compute this interior product to get a one form theta. So now theta will vanish on all the upward flows because they are uh, Lagrangians so the symplectic form vanishes, and they are so C star invariant. So therefore, this form is also going to vanish. And that way, you can um, prove that there is this defines a canonical map into the cotangent number of F, so that this one form is just the pullback along the trace map of the canonical Liouville form on the cotangent of the fixed point set. Uh, I can again, I Nigel, I'm sure has better words for that. I can do it uh, the, the map uh, by point by point, but I, I'm sure it can be said better. Anyway, so that's two ways to construct this trace map. And then what's very nice in the in this very this software, which is hopefully the only very stable ones, is that now they will embed the upward flow into T star of C, because that's what the, that component is. And now this was uh, actually first conjectured by Pierre Buzo, who was visiting IST. Uh, that uh, this synthetic thing, that what I have here, this upward flows, will intersect it as the spectral curve. And together with the trace map, they will embed it into T star C as it sits inside the spectral curve. So the statement is that the, the, uh, the attractor of the top one is precisely the universal spectral curve. The, the intersection with the, any fiber of the aging map is precisely the spectral curve and the trace map embeds this into T star C exactly as the spectral curve lives inside uh, T star C. So, and then I'm just writing it down uh, what this means. Uh, in the, so that was, uh, that's great that some of the synthetic way to see the spectral curve here. So now let's think about the BNR correspondence and I'll show you how again these synthetic ideas, how can I derive it from, from the mirror symmetry thing which we are studying. So we first recall the BNR correspondence. So you remember now we take any X bundle, <laughs> we don't need to be stable. Um, 
and then it will satisfy its characteristic polynomial. So there is this polynomial equation. Uh, and, and then uh, the, this Higgs field, uh, the, the J spiral of this, we will get these maps. And this will give us, um, again, this action of this bundle of algebras that we I have talked about. So this one is no longer itself, it's not a bundle of algebras, but it is a module over the bundle of algebra, which I have uh, just uh, um, defined it. And so this bundle of algebra then will have a module, a rank one module, which we, we, when we take specs, this will be a rank one sheaf over uh, the spectrum of this algebra, which sits inside K as the spectral curve. So that is actually one way to derive the DNR correspondence. When generically, then it is, of course, a line bundle. So it's a, this beautiful spectral curve, uh, and this BNR correspondence already Nigel had studied. Um, okay, so, so now I'm going to, to take the case, the generic case, when the fiber is smooth, the spectral curve is smooth. In that case, because now I'm trying to argue that you can get this LE, this bundle on CA, we are going to get it by mirror symmetry, right? So what does mirror symmetry do as we take any coherent sheaves uh, on, uh, on the SLM moduli space? And then we are going to uh, take the structure sheaf at that point, and we will be doing um, a fully unified transform uh, bundle uh, on the, uh, and then we will get, should be like, uh, yes. So when I take this uh, sky creeper sheaf, the mirror is going to be a line bundle, degree zero line bundle. Yeah, translation invariant line bundle on the, dual abelian variety, which is the fiber over the, in, the, in the dual Hitchin system. And um, so the rest, so here actually <coughs> we were working, the geometry was in the PGLN side. And the statement is that if I do mirror symmetry, and then this, uh, I will get a line bundle on this one. And if I restrict the line bundle on the, the spectral curve there, I'm going to re recover precisely the, the BNR line bundle. So that's uh, the, what I call the synthetic BNR correspondence. And what's very nice about this uh, idea is that it generalizes this to the, to the other components. So I have the higher, um, the higher degree uh, components. And then on the top, I always have a copy of C, the one of these fundamental um, um, upward flows. Uh, so in that case, it's going to be more interesting. We will now have, instead of just the uh, small Higgs field, we will have all these medium Higgs fields, uh, which we can uh, construct for any Higgs bundle. So you take any Higgs bundle, you construct these medium Higgs fields, and they're going to generate an action of this bundle of algebra structure we have constructed from the case with the fundamental Kirill of algebra on the case exterior power of the uh, of the vector bundle itself. And what we get is going to be a rank one module over this. And so this is a, another version of the DNR correspondence, but now it is over a different spectral curve. So this spectral curve will be not a N to one uh, cover, but it will be an N choose K to one cover, N choose K being the, well, the earlier characteristic of the Grassmannian. Uh, and also because the cohomologizing of the Grassmannian is no longer generated in H2, as it is the case for uh, P and, and Pn, I guess, um, Pn minus one, I, I, yeah. Um, then we will have to have a, a copy of the uh, power of K for each generator of the algebra. And then I told you that, the, for example, the first k of degree one, two, and k they generate the algebra. I could also take the second one to n minus k. So we can assume maybe k is less than or equal to n over two. And then we can embed the spectral curve into this higher vector bundle on the curve. And then you get a spectral curve. OK, now the same thing will be correct that the intersection, uh, I think, yeah, that the intersection will be this spectral curve. 
uh, but the, the, the trace map needs to be modified because it's no longer just the linear parts we are doing. So the trace map only uses the degree one, which in the cohomology refers to H2. And, and we have to actually get all the cohomology. So we have to have the all higher generators of the cohomology. Okay, so that was VNR correspondent. And now let's go back and now put things together and explain how actually mirror symmetry matches um, the upward flow and then its description uh, as the spectrum of equivalent cohomology with that of this Kirill algebra. Okay, here is our motivation. We want to understand uh, how, what is the Hecken transformation of the Hitchin section. So for PGNN, and the fundamental representation. Now, this is the heuristics why we would expect a bundle of algebra structure on the mirror along the Hitchin section. And the reason for that is that on one side of the mirror symmetry, uh, we, we should get the upward flow on this vector space, which is therefore a sheaf of algebras. The structure sheaf of a vector space or any uh, variety uh, is always a sheaf of algebras. I can multiply uh, functions. And then when you do, now you do relative Fourier equation transform, you should think about what happens with the sheaf of algebra when you do Fourier equation transform. Well, it's not going to uh, be a sheaf of algebras because uh, tensor product goes to, um, to um, convolution, but over the identity element, uh, which uh, it itself convolves trivially, you will actually get a multiplication. And so because of that, we expect that the mirror of a sheaf of algebras, at least along the Hitchin section, which corresponds to the identity element, should be, should acquire a sheaf of algebra structures. In our case, this is a vector bundle, so it actually should be a bundle of algebras. And so we argue that uh, by mirror symmetry, by Fourier equation transform, we should get this structure of uh, bundle of algebras. And in fact, there, so we get the, this BNR thing because it's not just that we have a bundle of algebra over the identity, that bundle of algebra will act on at any other point. The convolution will not change. So you will get this module structure too, which we used in the BNR correspondence. It's somehow all should come from mirror symmetry. And okay, and I have this now big fancy diagram, which puts the two sides together. So here we had the description of the apart flow as the spectrum of equivariant cohomology. Mm -hmm. Now on the other side we had the bundle of algebra structures along, okay, along the Hitchin section, which we identify with the dual Hitchin base. <clears throat> and and then you can then close down the diagram to get a completely commutative diagram. And and first you can argue that this is the spectrum of the Kirillov algebra is the same, or the Kirillov algebra is isomorphic with the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. In fact, this was noticed by um, Panyushev. He showed it for the, on the same side, so he didn't have Lagrange duality, but it turns out that we actually have to take the Lagrange rule side, which in uh, type B actually matters uh, and see when it's not so dual. Uh, but, but it's correct, so the, so even though the, these partial flag varieties are not the same for Lagrange real groups, but the recovariant cohomology rings are isomorphic. So uh, then what I'm going to talk tomorrow is that this picture generalizes to non minuscule representations, or not completely the geometry, I still don't understand, but uh, the algebra definitely generalizes. And so you can think of this as the classical limit of the geometric Sotakia equivalence. So this would be uh, uh, the end of this part, but because of um, tomorrow, I'm going to do not just the general case in terms of big X fields. First, I would like to uh, show you one more, uh, because I will talk about real forms, one more application of the synthetic ideas to real forms. And that's the so-called traceless Lagrangians. Because uh, now we have the trace map and we can take the pre-image of the zero section and then that actually is going to be a, a Lagrangian. And so it's a universal Lagrangian, which lives in any uh, symplectic variety with a C structure with homogeneity <clears throat> one. I can take any uh, attractor and I can take the trace map down to the cotangent bundle of the fixed point set. And then I can take the pre-image of the zero section. In fact, I can take any Lagrangian here 
and then I can take the premium. Now, if I take the uh, fiber Lagrangian, then I get the, the usual Lagrangian of the upward flow. If I take the zero section, and today we are going to confine ourselves to that, I'm going to get uh, the, um, the traces Lagrangian, but in fact, you can take any, uh, so any sub variety in F and then the colonial bundle, and you can take the pre image of that, you will get a Lagrangian. But there is nice just to take the zero section, which uh, I just denote by F. And when you take all of them together, I call the, the traces Lagrangian. This can be defined, as I said, in any uh, uh, semi projective uh, symplectic variety in the weight one symplectic form. And that's also easy to see the linear algebra at the, at the fixed point of the cis direction. The traceless Lagrangian should just have a tangent space, which contains the non negative weights of the cis direction, except that would be the objector. But you kill the, the, the degree one part. So you throw out the degree one part. And then you can see that this actually is Lagrangian because, uh, because T0 is paired with T1. So that T1 is. Thrown out, thrown out, and then T two is paired with T minus one, so it's exactly picks up one of those weights from the from the dual pairs. So it's indeed um, the the right uh, uh, for the tangent space. And then let me show you another Lagrangian. Which uh, so first I was very confused about this because there is another Lagrangian due to uh, well, I, I don't know exactly who did it first, but in this paper there is a whole theory of involutions on the Higgs moduli space. And one of them, which will play an important role tomorrow as well, is uh, corresponding the, to the real forms of Hodge type, um, the compact uh, real form inner pass. Anyway, it's a very simple involution. It's just taking the, the Higgs field to minus uh, if itself. And then it is, um, because the cis direction was weight one, this one has will be anti holomorphic the fixed point set will be a Lagrangian. And then it has this beautiful description of it as certain moduli space of these uh, real Higgs bundles uh, corresponding to all the real forms uh, in the inner class, in this case of the compact real form. Uh, but it's also very easy to understand the tangent space. It's just the linear algebra thing. This one picks out all the even degree uh, weights. And that also is very nice, you can see that it is also picks up exactly one from the dual pairs. And so I just did not understand how could I have two Lagrangians, um, which are, con okay. And then what's the argument? Let me see, what do I say? Okay, I will say that L is inside this one. No. No, it's the other way around. M should be inside mine. Okay, it's wrong with the written. Okay, let me just see, see. So, oh, no, no, this is the Lagrangian. Oh, it's correct here. Yeah, yeah. And then Oscar's and uh, Ramanan's Lagrangian is contained here. So you can show that the minus one fixed point set, a minus one fixed point is always, um, always uh, lives in a, on a traceless upward flow. And uh, so it contains, so you have two Lagrangians, one containing the other, and this is clearly not the same. And, and uh, what I found the, the way out of this is that one Lagrangian, um, namely Oscar's, is a closure of part of the uh, traceless Lagrangian. So you take the two part things, they are special because in this case, you only have weights uh, zero uh, and, um, and, um, and two and one and minus one, only four weights of the two types. And in that case, the two description agree. And only in those components of the traceless Lagrangian are precisely their components. And then, because in the other cases, it doesn't agree. So those components cannot be included. So that's what, which, why it is true that what uh, that uh, Oscar's Lagrangian is the closure of this part of the traceless Lagrangian. Anyway, so why I wanted to show you this because it comes from the same circle of ideas. And also what's interesting is that there is a natural conjecture about the mirror of some of these traceless Lagrangians, namely the minus Q ones, the very stable ones. That will conclude this one. And then, then I can do the last slide. 
So the conjecture is very similar actually to Nigel's conjecture in the case of U and N. In fact, it comes from the analogy with U11, because when we have U11, then the top, then this, the, the stresses Lagrangian on the top, of, then it's a CF1 is as a component of uh, the U11 moduli space. And in that case, the two agrees. And then you could know, you could know from Nigel what the mirror should be and generalizing that, but also having some Hecke transformation ideas. I conjecture that there is a vector bundle, which Nigel says again that because of his way to construct this Dirac vector bundles has a natural hyperholomorphic connection. So you take the uh, the Higgs bundle, the universal Higgs bundle, but now in this representation, and you just take the small Higgs field, uh, and then you compute the hyperhomology of this along the curve. That gives you a, um, a vector bundle generically. I guess, uh, on the moduli space, and that carries a hyperhomorphic correction. So the conjecture is that this minuscule traceless Lagrangians on the top, which I, by the way, except in rank two, they are disjoint from, I mean, that's not, uh, uh, they don't live inside the, uh, um, they are not components of the uh, fixed point set, they are not real forms. Uh, but so that's a conjecture. What's interesting about this eventually, uh, me or someone, uh, should try to play the same game with this, that's what we play with the U11. Uh, uh, once with this, with here, the nice thing is that this is just the curve. There's some vector bundle where the curve, you should be able to compute indices. You can do the checking of the Equivarian Euler form thing. So that's, that's interesting for that. Okay, so let me finish just to save time from tomorrow because at the end tomorrow there will be many conjectures and I wanted to have some open questions at the end. So let me have the first slide from tomorrow. And at SO it's good because it's just motivation. So, yeah, so instead of uh, not talking about big algebras, I will give you the motivation to, to, to think about the big algebra and what is the big algebra, what is it going to be? So that's the last slide, so motivation or trying to construct the big algebras. So now we are going to look at any highest weight representation of SLN, of um, the dominant uh, weight of SLN, which typically will be not minuscule, typically not be high, uh, weight multiplicity free. So this algebra, the Kirillov algebra is not commutative. Um, so it's an associative algebra, but it is not commutative. But still, we would like to get the mirror of the universal bundle at that point in this representation. So we have our, we have this motivation from physics that the mirror of this should be the appropriate Hecke transformation of the Hitchin section. But this is difficult uh, geometrically, and no longer elementary, no longer uh, fundamental or a minuscule Hecke transformation, because the space of Hecke transformation is singular and that complicates things. But roughly speaking, still this thing should be the push forward of the pullback. So it, it acts from a correspondence. I use the same letter for the operator as for the correspondent. It is not completely uh, well defined everywhere. Um, and so that's what wants to, again, say that because of this construction, we would expect that the uh, Hecke transform teaching section should also carry the structure of a sheaf of algebras, and then by mirror symmetry, you would expect the structure of a bundle of algebras of the irreducible, of the, the universal vector bundle in the given representation restricted to a point and restricted to the aging section. So we would like to see a sheaf of algebras, which is always commutative. So I would like to see a commutative algebra. Those operators which are naturally coming from here uh, uh, should be here, should come from here too. So that motivates that we would like to find a commutative subalgebra here. So this is no longer um, a commutative, but we would like to find a commutative subalgebra. And so we want to use it to build the bundle of algebra structure. So we want this to be a cyclic subalgebra, commutative subalgebra. In fact, you can prove that if it's cyclic, this is going to be maximal. So that's the name big, because it's what we are searching for is a big commutative subalgebra of the Kirillov algebra. And uh, and then that was the quest I, I had a year ago. 
Um, and then uh, I, I tell you what I did know. So, okay, so we have now the putative big algebra is going to be a subalgebra of the Kirillov algebra. It should be commutative. It should be cyclic and therefore maximal and therefore big. And then we will want this because this should model uh, the spectrum of the big algebra, should model um, the spectrum of this Hecker transform Tichy sanction on the dual side. So that's our geometric motivation. And so I next time tomorrow I will just tell you my original conjecture and later which we could prove a theorem, why would I have looked at those operators in the big algebra or in the Kirill algebra? So first, uh, the best was that I, I fortunately had some other people, algebraic people, more algebraically minded people, students of Kirillo working out the, the Kirillo algebra in the first um, non-commutative case, basically is the adjoint representation of SL3. SL2, everything is weight multiplicity three, nothing interesting there. SL3 has the first non weight multiplicity free representation, the adjoint representation, which of course has a weight multiplicity two at the zero weight because it's a rank two group. And, and then it, there is a sort of explicit description of the algebra there. So I was playing with that algebra. In fact, here, I think it was relatively easy to find a commutative subalgebra. But then there was another student of Kirillov who described all the adjoint. Uh, okay, it should go up. These things should go up for some reason. It's they are done. All the Kirillov algebras in the adjoint representation for any simple one. So now this is a whole thesis. And, uh, and again, here I could find um, a candidate of the big commutative subalgebra. Basically, in this case, it's just any one generated by H2. So this algebra is generated by H2. For more general cases, there are always very few, two, three, maybe four. I don't know what's the largest number, some special and exceptional cases. It depends on the complications of the, the, the invariant polynomials and the big, big, of the big algebra. But very few uh, generators are going to be enough to, to, to get this commutative subalgebra. Okay, they all, so this is I just found by inspection. And then there was another hint that, of course, a maximal quantity uh, subalgebra should contain the center. And the center was described by Kirillov in terms of his operators. So we know how to construct those operators. So you will see tomorrow how the M operators are defined. And so we will just generalize that definition. And also, I think I was reading um, um, about the Mischenko Fomenko integrable system. For some reason, I don't remember now. Um, and then, when you look at the definition that is constructed by invariant uh, from invariant polynomials on the Lie algebra, at a point in the Lie algebra, you will just differentiate uh, in that direction of the Lie algebra your invariant polynomials, and that. Uh, any number of times you can, um, and, and that is, turns out to be an integrable system. And then we will do the same uh, with our big algebra uh, tomorrow. We will generalize Kirillov's M operators to these big operators, and that will be the, uh, that will be the big algebra that will happen tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Question? That the uh, convolution of the cooperators and the first story. Um, is this just like applying one after the other? Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, I mean they will. I mean they, they the, the geometric sataka will play an important role. You know of this, and there of course you have the, the representation ring of the of the group, but the geometrically. The geometry side is less developed, so I can define things you will see tomorrow by algebra. But indeed, eventually, uh, right. And because of uh, that, for example, uh, you, it's enough to just use these fundamental check operators and then do one of the, the other because they commute and then understand the product. Yes, yeah, so they, that's right. They should, uh, they will play a role in if we have eventually a geometrical understanding of. 
of, of the things. But uh, in ESO, because you will see many of the arguments or conjectures I will make, I use various versions of the geometric setup here. Isomorphism in there too, you have the, in these guys maybe, but you have the archaeological. Can I ask a question? If you go back to the previous uh, slide. Okay. Um, yeah. So you have that involution, but as you know, there are other involutions that are defined by not, uh, not inner involutions of the group, right? They also produce Lagrangian varieties. Do you have something similar to this picture? Because well, you will see tomorrow, I will see a lot of uh, conjectural things about all the involutions. Uh, um, but the geometry is more complicated, I think, in, as you know. Except on the other hand, as far as I understand, so there is the Chevalier uh, involution I like, the one corresponding to split real form. And if I am correct, if I think is that um, the Chevalier involution may be not so easy to understand on the Higgs panels. You know, this is your thing about the, the, tra the transpose, the dual vector right. and the yeah, transpose yeah. field. But on the Hitchin fiber, it acts very nicely because it's just minus one there. Yeah. So interestingly, that is very nice on the Hitchin fiber, but globally less easy to understand. And so on the upward flows, we have looked at them with the, with the Miguel, the, it's more complicated. So somehow this is just very nice, this taking of the even directions on the upward flow. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated on the, on the other ones. But as I say, some things are nicer for, for example, for the splitting across. Okay, so since we are actually with the, uh, so let's thank uh, Tamash. <laughs>